You're listening to an Ono Media podcast. Good morning, and thanks for joining me for Rise in Crime, your morning caffeine hit all about crime. I'm Mama Jules, and I have another city politician who has found himself on the wrong side of the law. Here's what police are saying happened in a statement released last week. They say two boys pulled up to a property that was fenced and gated in Jefferson County, Colorado. Now, it seems one of the teens picked up the other teen at Dakota Ridge High School near Littleton on Tuesday afternoon. The longtime friends left school with a mission. They wanted to find a picturesque site for homecoming photos. They began their journey in Ken Carl Valley, and then they ended up in Deer Creek Canyon. That's when they spotted the home on Pleasant Park Road with a lake and a dock, and they decided to hop the fence and ask the homeowner for permission to return on the night of the homecoming dance to take their photos. So here's what we've got with these boys. They've parked at the home's gate, then they jump the fence and they walk up the driveway. The boys said they thought no one was home, so they walked around the property looking to see if the homeowner was outside somewhere. They then allegedly went back to their car and began penning a note for the homeowner, asking for permission to take their homecoming pictures on the property. As the two boys were in their car, presumably writing that note, 38-year-old Brent Metz pulled up next to the boys' Audi S4. He kind of blocks the Audi with his pickup truck, and it seems Brent is the boyfriend of the homeowner. And the girlfriend, well, she's in the house, and she didn't answer the boys when they knocked. Instead, she called Brent, and she also called 911. In both calls, she referred to the boys as trespassers on her property. And as you can imagine, Brent is a little hot when he steps out of his truck. But should he be this hot? Because as he is walking towards the boy's car, Brent allegedly raises a handgun and shoots through the car's windshield when the cops arrived. Because remember, they've already been called. Well, when they arrive, they found one of the boys bleeding from his face, with the other boy applying pressure to the wound with the t-shirt he had ripped from his own body and used to aid his friend. Brent, well, he was there too. And according to the affidavit, he wouldn't answer if he had shot the boy. Instead, he just kept saying he needed a lawyer. But he actually did tell police that the gun was in his truck. And that's exactly where they found the weapon. Now, according to court records, Brent had said the phrase, oh shit, my gun went off, after he shot the boy through the windshield. Now, it seems the boys might be backing up that claim that this might be an accidental shooting. The boy who was shot allegedly told the deputy that he didn't see the gun before he heard the sound and then felt the pain, and that he also thought he didn't think Brent meant to shoot him. Now, the shirtless teen told officers that Brent had tried to help the boys after the shooting, but that he had pushed him away because he didn't want his help. Brent was arrested and transported to the sheriff's office where he was booked into jail for first-degree assault, felony menacing, illegal discharge of a firearm, and reckless endangerment. The 17-year-old teen is recovering at a local hospital, and scans of his head show that he has a part of a bullet lodged in his skull. Brent Metz serves on the city council for the very small town of Mountain View, Colorado. It has about 530 homes and roughly 15 businesses. The city council generally meets twice a month, so he is an active politician. Brent is no longer listed on the jail registry, and the city has yet to release a statement. And now to Florida. And Florida, you are always trying to one-up yourself, and you did it again this week with two different stories. The first one, this case involves 37-year-old James Melody of Daytona Beach. Now, James was working as a paramedic for Flagler County. Now, that's a different jurisdiction than Daytona Beach, even though Daytona is a city in the county. So we've got two different agencies going on here. Now, the Daytona Beach police were investigating James in a connection to a criminal sexual case. And it was during a forensic audit of James' cell phone that investigators with Daytona Beach discovered two videos from October of 2021. In the videos, James is clearly wearing a Flagler County paramedic uniform. And here's where it gets ugly. James is recording himself 
sexually abusing an unconscious woman who was in his care while he was working as a paramedic. Yep, he videoed himself sexually assaulting the woman. Sheriff Staley from Flagler County said the following, This is an unfathomable attack and a disgusting attack on a helpless individual that called for medical emergency services. He then clarified his statement saying, actually, she didn't even call. It was another individual who called because she was unconscious. And to take advantage of this, tarnish the badge that they wear, tarnish the agency that they work for and the community is just disgusting. And I hope the prosecution and the courts will recognize what he has done and the damage he has done because people are likely to be concerned now to call for help. And then, you know, people could die as a result or suffer from serious injuries, and he needs to pay a heavy price for that. He kept going with the statement when he said, these are serious felonies. One charge alone is up to 30 years in prison, and I hope he gets every bit of that. Well, Sheriff Staley wasn't finished with that fire statement. He said that based on specific details of what the investigators saw when they reviewed the videos, He believes it wasn't the first time James had taken advantage of a female patient. He said Flagler County transports hundreds of people each year, which then provided James with hundreds of opportunities while on shift. He said it does not appear that this was James' first time. Now, I've never had to ride in an ambulance myself, and I'm so grateful for my health. And the only time one of my children has ever ridden in an ambulance was when my youngest was born at 28 weeks and she only weighed two and a half pounds. We rode in an ambulance from the hospital to the airport and then from the airport to a new hospital as we were transporting her for more acute care to a different hospital in a different state. So here's the deal. I was with her the whole time. Sheriff Staley says riding along in the ambulance is one way that abuse can be prevented. He recommended to family and friends that if a paramedic will let you ride along with your loved one to the hospital, then do that. He called it an added layer of protection. Now, James remains jailed without bond on the Flagler sexual assault case, and he is still being investigated for the Daytona Beach sex crimes case. Authorities are saying that James did confess to the crimes shown in the videos. It's also important to note He had already retired from Flagler County Fire Rescue earlier in 2024. Sheriff Staley said the following, Once in a while, you get a rotten apple, and this is a rotten apple that needs to be buried under the jail with the keys thrown away. Well, the female victim from the 2021 videos, she no longer lives in Flagler County, but she has been found and notified of the assault. And we're staying in Florida for that second Florida story, where a self-proclaimed Instagram model has now been sent back to jail with additional charges for the deaths of two men in early August. 24-year-old social media model Macy Lathers was speeding down a Miami city street shortly before 7 a.m. on August 10th when she accelerated from about 55 miles per hour to 78 miles per hour. She blew a red light and allegedly slammed her white Mercedes into a black Range Rover and a 2012 silver Suzuki. When the police arrived at the scene, one occupant of the Suzuki was dead, another was severely injured, and Macy was lying in the middle of the street, writhing in pain, or maybe she was so high she was experiencing some sort of other feeling. Police body cam footage shows a topless Macy vomiting in the street and screaming at officers, telling them she is from the future and that she has a crystal ball. She also repeatedly yells that her name is Mercedes. When officers ask Macy if she has taken any drugs, she responds by saying she had ingested 2C, a drug that is also known as pink cocaine. In the video, she continues to struggle with officers and she makes outlandish claims as she is loaded onto a stretcher to be transported to the hospital. She is shown screaming about aliens coming. She yells, they're coming, go, 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 go. Aliens are coming, go, 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 go. Now, one man was in the Range Rover. He was treated for his minor injuries and three people were inside the Suzuki. Abraham Mullen and his friend, Jesus Rubio and Abraham's fiance, Juanita Hernandez. They were all on their way to work. 
when Macy slammed into their car. Jesus and Abraham both died. Timed with the release of the body cam footage were also the release of Macy's toxicology reports. She was found to have ketamine and other drugs in her system at the time of the accident. She has now had additional charges of DUI manslaughter added to her previous charges of vehicular manslaughter, reckless driving, driving on a suspended license, and leaving the scene of a crash. She shouldn't even have been driving the car to begin with, you guys. Now, she had previously bonded out of jail, but her house arrest ended on Tuesday with the additional manslaughter charges. She has pleaded not guilty to all 10 charges. A GoFundMe page describes that Abraham has a 16-year-old son that has now been left fatherless. Juanita's injuries have also left her unable to work. The 16-year-old boy has been left without care since his mother resides in Nicaragua and she suffers from Parkinson's disease. Her health ailments make it impossible for her to care for her son or provide financial support. Now, if Macy is found guilty of DUI manslaughter times two, she will spend at least eight years in prison, but she could spend over 20 years if found guilty of all the charges. And now to this heartbreaking story out of Indiana that has me feeling like this could happen to just about any parent. And you guys, I can't really tell you the story better than the grandmother of 18-month-old Azana Trentman did. Here's what Tanya Wood wrote on her Facebook page. Our family has been overwhelmed by the love and support for our sweet baby Azana, and we can't thank you enough. For those who don't know, Wednesday started off as a regular day. Austin and Shayna decided to visit a new thrift store in Dillsboro. They browsed items and Azana was playing with a backpack she discovered in the store. At some point, Azana found something in the backpack and she ingested it. Austin took immediate action to clear her mouth and induce vomiting since he wasn't sure what it was. He tasted the substance and it tasted sweet and it had a melted candy consistency. Azana acted normal, so they decided it was probably candy, and they continued on with their day. It was nap time when they finished at the store, and Azana hadn't been sleeping well due to teething. During the car ride to Lawrenceburg, she fell asleep. When they arrived home from running those errands, their world turned upside down. Azana required urgent medical attention, so they rushed her to a Dearborn County Hospital, where she was stabilized for transport to Cincinnati Children's Hospital. After many days of testing, yesterday we finally got results that are devastating. The toxicology report indicated the substance was a fruit-flavored dissolvable suboxone pill. We are heartbroken that Azana is suffering due to someone's negligence in leaving such a dangerous item in a donated backpack. We are also troubled by the thrift store's apparent failure to thoroughly inspect donated items before they are placed for sale. We are still praying for a miracle as Azana's condition has shown no improvement despite many interventions with the best care team in the nation. We ask that you continue to pray for Azana and her parents during this incredibly challenging time. We believe in miracles, and that is what it's going to take to get us all through this. Well, unfortunately, the next day after Azana's grandmother made this post, little Azana died at the Cincinnati Children's Hospital. The miracle that Azana's parents, Austin and Shayna, prayed for didn't quite come true But other miracles did occur because they made the decision to donate three of Azana's organs to help other children whose parents and loved ones were praying for that miracle. So what is Suboxone? Well, it's the primary medication to treat opioid addiction. The medication attaches to the receptors of the brain to blunt intoxication from drugs like heroin and morphine. In adults, it also prevents cravings of those drugs. But in a child the size of Azana, it caused brain damage. So the question remains, why is that medication in a child's backpack? You guys, I don't have an answer and neither does the family. On Shayna's Facebook page, there are pictures in a pinned post with her and Austin and Azana where they are painting what appears to be a nursery 
for the upcoming birth of Azana's little sister. Shayna is due in January. A GoFundMe has raised over $20,000 to help with funeral expenses. Now, the Dearborn County Sheriff's Office said the toddler's cause of death is still under investigation as they await further results from her autopsy. Now, as you know, it was Friday the 13th last week, and if you're the suspicious type, it means weird things might go down on that day. Or maybe in the case of this story, some people are just bad people, and it has nothing to do with a date. I'll let you decide. On Friday the 13th, at about 12.40 in the morning, a man stopped in at a Waffle House in North Carolina. Now, this Waffle House is about 100 miles southwest of Raleigh. After he ordered inside the restaurant, this customer became more and more agitated, claiming that it was taking too long to get his food. He started verbally abusing the workers, which I'm sure wasn't the first time for these employees because people are just plain rude. Now, the employees finished his order and handed him his food to go, and the rude customer walked out of the establishment. But as he left the building and walked towards his car, the man turned and fired two shots in the direction of the building. One of those shots hit 18-year-old restaurant employee Burley Dawson Locklear. Burley later died from the gunshot wound at a local hospital. The man, who is now a suspect in Burley's murder, drove off in a dark gray older model Chevrolet. The gunman is still at large at the time of this recording and is described as black with lighter skin, long dreadlocks, and a beard and a mustache. He is estimated to be about maybe five foot eight to five foot ten inches tall, and he is of medium build. He was wearing a dark hoodie and jeans with white shoes. And police are asking anyone with information to contact the Lawrenceburg Police Department. And you can specifically ask for Lieutenant Jay White at 910-276-3211. If you would prefer to stay anonymous, you can call 910-266-8146. Now, local CBS affiliate WBTW reported the Waffle House issued a statement. They said the following. We are mourning the tragic death of one of our Waffle House associates who was the victim of an outrageous act of violence earlier this morning at our Laurenburg, North Carolina restaurant. The death of our associate, 18-year-old Burley Dawson Locklear, known simply as Dawson to his friends and family, is horrific. The statement then went on to say, We offer our sincerest and deepest sympathy to his family and friends. We are offering free counseling services to our associates as we all mourn this tragic loss of life. Now, as I went to recording, the suspect's name was released on social media accounts, but he had not officially been named by law enforcement. So I'm going to report what this specific outlet is saying. It's called the North Carolina Beat. It says Carlos Lozano Jr. is the man who killed Burley. They even published multiple pictures of the man. If it is Carlos, I hope he is quickly apprehended. I will keep you updated on this case. And an update to the case I brought you on Thursday. The Wisconsin Crime Lab has confirmed that the skeletal remains that were found in a wooded area by a hunter are those of missing toddler Elijah View. Police Chief Benjamin Minert told reporters, the family is devastated, that law enforcement is devastated, and that the community is devastated. He said he had never met the boy before he was reported missing by his mother and her boyfriend, but that he had watched a three-year-old bring out the best in his community. Okay, remember this area where the skeletal remains were found? Well, it had been searched multiple times since Elijah was reported missing in February of this year. But nothing had been found until the hunter stumbled across the makeshift grave. I don't think that the remains were really buried, but that's where he seems to have been since February. Now, the investigation is shifting from a missing persons case to a death investigation. Elijah's mother and her boyfriend, Katrina Bauer and Jesse Vang, they both remain jailed on child neglect charges. At the time of this recording, neither has been charged with Elijah's death, but I would guess that won't last long. I'll keep you updated. A 
now an update, sort of, to a case that has been rolling around in my mind since I brought you the story back in January. I think I've actually talked to you three different times about this case because I find it so intriguing and bizarre. All right, you might remember that 37-year-old David Harrington, 36-year-old Clayton McGinney, and 38-year-old Ricky Johnson, well, they all attended a football watch party at Jordan Willis's home in Kansas City. Okay, the Chargers were playing the Chiefs for the afternoon football game on that Sunday, and the men were avid Chiefs fans. When the three men didn't return to their everyday lives on Monday or Tuesday, family began searching. That led one of the men's girlfriends to break into the home of Jordan Willis, where she could see one of the men through a window lying dead in the backyard of the home. She retreated and called the police. And when they searched the home, they found all three men dead outside in the backyard. Here's where it gets weird. Jordan was in the home and he did come to the door for police, but didn't come to the door minutes earlier when the woman was frantically calling and knocking all of this before she broke in through the garage. When he did answer the door to the knocks from the police, Jordan was wearing boxers and holding a glass of wine. He told officers he had been asleep for two days. I heard from many of you at the time back when I reported this story, how weird you thought this was. And it got weirder as it went along because Jordan moved out of that home one week later and he's been silent. All communication has come through his lawyer, John Paserno. All right, well, here's the sort of update. Attorney Paserno is telling People Magazine that he believes charges will be filed in the coming weeks, but those charges will not be filed against his client, Jordan, the renter of the home where the party was held. Instead, he believes charges will be filed against the person who provided drugs to Clayton, David, and Ricky. So let's clarify a couple of things here. David's father has said that Kansas City police have read him a toxicology report that indicated cocaine and fentanyl were found in the men's bodies. But KC police have not released that toxicology report. And Kansas City police have previously told People Magazine that the investigation is not a homicide investigation. But in a statement to People about the comments made by Jordan's lawyer, a police spokesperson said, Investigators did advise they are continuing to work with the Platte County Prosecutor's Office and could have some updates in the coming weeks. So that's kind of leading us to think maybe this guy knows what he's talking about. Attorney Paserno did go on to tell the New York Post that the length of the death probe of the three men is, quote, definitely out of the ordinary. He said he can't understand why it has taken nine months. The statement by the KC police is the only communication that has been provided on the deaths in recent months. One other man who has never been identified was at the home on that Sunday night. He told officers he left early and was not the last person to see the three men alive. The families of the three men have threatened to file a civil lawsuit against Jordan, but I'm sure that might have been delayed by the nine months of investigative work. So like I said, it's an update, sort of. I will be watching to see if those charges will be filed and if Jordan's lawyer is in fact correct. All right, that's your Monday episode of Rise in Crime. Thanks for joining me. I love having you here on Rise in Crime and I love being part of your day. Also, I always ask this, but I I just can't emphasize enough how much it helps the podcast grow. Please recommend this show to a friend. Um, You can download, you can leave a comment that helps the show grow. And of course, we love five-star reviews and positive comments. Please like and follow on all of our social media and YouTube accounts that we have here at Oh No Media. Quick reminder, that's Into the Dark, Murder with My Husband, and Rise in Crime. You can join me again on Thursday for more morning crime news. I'm Mama Jules, and keep safe out there.